This week marks the 80th anniversary of the largest military campaign in human history. Now and forever, Operation Barbarossa, in terms of scale, scope, destruction, death, and savagery, will never, ever be topped, I don't believe. Hey, everybody, I'm Steve Green with Bill Whittle and Scott Ott, and this is Right Angle, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. Gentlemen, you look at the scale of the start of Operation Barbarossa. On the Nazi German side, you had about 3.8 million military personnel, uh, somewhere around 3,500 tanks, another 3,000 armored fighting vehicles, um, up to about 5,000 aircraft, nobody knows how many, somewhere between 7,000 and 23,000 artillery pieces, 17,000 mortars, 600,000 vehicles, and it's underappreciated that the, the, the Nazi German military was only partially horses. motorized. They also had 600,000 horses to help drag a lot of that artillery and supplies along. On the Soviet side, around 3 million military personnel, 11,000 tanks, if you can believe that, and maybe as many as 9,000 military aircraft. The war, of course, dragged on for four years. Uh, millions of Germans killed in the fighting, 27 million Soviets killed, mostly civilians, and mostly either murdered or starved on purpose by the Nazis. As I said, there's never been anything like it in human history, and hopefully there never will be. Uh, Bill, the thing that gets me, though, is, uh, you know, Hitler and Stalin had agreed to carve up Eastern Europe between them in the uh, uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1939. Two years later, of course, Hitler turns his <laughs> army loose on Stalin. But one of the reasons the Germans were so successful in the opening weeks of the war is the Soviet army, the Red Army, was lined up right on the border in what looks to me like an offensive position. Do you really think it was just a matter of time before Hitler or Stalin initiated hostilities? I don't buy the idea that uh, that the Russians were getting ready to attack and Hitler preempted them. Uh, nothing oh, that no, followed, not preempted. No, Hitler, well, nothing Hitler that meant, followed yeah. that gives any indication other than the fact that Stalin was knocked on his heels. After the news had sunken in about three or four days after the initial reports, when he was sure it was really happening, Stalin simply disappeared for 10 days, went to his dacha. And finally, uh, Khrushchev and Molotov and, and, and uh, you know, Malenkov and, and Beria went to his dacha to see if he would come back. And when Stalin saw them, he was sure they were there to have him killed, have him shot. He was utterly convinced he'd, he'd completely lost the war. They said, no, we need you to come back and, and, and lead us to victory, which he did uh, eventually. Um, but he was gobsmacked, utterly gobsmacked. And you can't hide an invasion force of four million people and God knows how many tanks. But Stalin refused to see it. And report after report over weeks and weeks and weeks were that the Germans were massing on the border, massing on the border. They were flying reconnaissance flights over Soviet territory illegally. Uh, Stalin kept saying, no, 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 we're not going to be provoked. Someone's trying to provoke us into this war. And then all hell broke loose. About three or four hours before the actual attack began, a German des deserter came over to the Soviet lines and told them, you have no idea what's coming. It's coming. You guys better be ready. They passed that on to the Kremlin. Uh, Stalin was so deep in denial that he had the guy shot. Uh, so, um, so there's that. Uh, speaking of, of, of that kind of individuality in the war, and this is the thing really about it, the, the, the battle on the Eastern Front was the worst thing that ever happened. That really, I, I, you yeah. maybe could make an exception for the, for the Black Plague, maybe. But, but in terms of human um, intent, it was the worst thing that ever happened. And you hear these stories about millions killed and so on. Uh, I married a Russian woman and... Uh, one of the reasons that we hit it off in the first place, because I knew an awful lot about Russian history. She tells me I taught her an awful lot more about Russia than she knew before. But in any event, having married a Russian woman, I find out that she had a grandfather who would be my grandfather-in-law who was killed, I think, on the second or third day of the war. He was just a, a private on an outpost there, and he was just doing his duty, and he just got squashed by this juggernaut that just rolled over. Um, it's... We talked on our backstage show, Steve. You said that Nazi Germany was the worst regime in history. I agree. Absolutely. And this is where the worst regime in history attacked the second worst regime in history. 
and uh, and the savagery and the brutality of of the of the Eastern Front in in that three year war defies imagination and defies certainly speaking about. But the short form of what happened after Barbarossa was. The Germans went in, they massacred everybody. They could have turned the Ukrainians to their side, but they went in there and just were brutalized everybody. And they they basically burned Russia all the way to Stalingrad, uh, all the way to Leningrad in the north, Moscow in the middle, and Stalingrad in the south. That was the limit of their penetration. And everywhere they went, they destroyed everything. And by the way, it bears mentioning that one of the first things that happened after the after the Germans rolled into your town, the Wehrmacht would come through and then they'd push on. And then right behind them would be these Einsatzgruppen, these special uh, special group forces, special forces group. And their job was to round up all the Jews, all the communists and shoot them immediately, just kill them all. Hundreds of thousands of people just shot in the head in, in just hours behind the, the, the German advance. So all of this terror, and then on the way back, when the when the Russians crossed the line into German-held Poland, and especially into the heart of Germany, they paid them back with uh, interest. And that has the ring of justice to it to some degree. But all it means is that millions and millions and millions and millions of people murdered, raped, tortured, yeah. killed, and and the scale of it is beyond our imagination, it's just beyond our imagination. We will never see the like of it again. I'm sure of that. Uh, it's possible that we may have more fatalities in a war, a nuclear war, but we will never see those kind of numbers again. And as, as you all know, Steve, um, much later, really just after they'd hit their high watermark, the Germans were uh, trying to fight a last ditch battle at a place called Kursk. And I think there were 7,000, 8,000 tanks on one field. They were, they were literally muzzle to muzzle. You could have put bayonets on these tanks. And, and, and there was just nothing but hours and hours and hours of fire and death and destruction. And that was just, that was just one day of three years. It's, a, it's an important anniversary. I'm very glad you picked it because when you think – I use I used to use this expression a lot more cavalierly than I do now. Whenever somebody, you know, I I like I didn't get the I asked for um, I did I asked to not have any jalapeno sauce on my on my chicken sandwich. You know, God damn it! I, I would I used to say, man, this is worse than Stalingrad. I would say that as a joke, but uh, after marrying a Russian woman, she said uh, that's that's not funny. No. Yeah, the uh, the two battles that really determine the fate of the Eastern Front. The first was Stalingrad, where Germany lost a quarter of a million men there in the uh, the Sixth Army that was that was trapped in that pocket because of Hitler's you know no retreat order, not one inch, um, and that cut out the German ability to wage an offensive campaign. And then Kursk. Uh, the Germans lost so many tanks and so many men that after that, that cut the heart out of their ability to even defend themselves. And yeah, I, I, would, I would like to just add one thing, The Russian heroism was uh, amazing. Everybody amazing. talks about Stalingrad. Most people who know anything about the history of the war know about Stalingrad uh, and, the, and the desperate and, and heroic fighting that the, that the Soviets did there holding that line. They, for, for a while there, they were down to a size of two football fields. That's, that's it. That's all they had on that side of, of the river. The Volga, yeah. But nobody talks about Leningrad and the siege of Leningrad, a million people starved to death, a million people starved to death in the course of almost two years. And and that is a horrible way to go. And uh, I just thought that bared mentioning because uh, it's easily overlooked. Uh, Scott, Europe posted uh, two pretty horrific wars pretty close together. The World War One and its even bigger sequel, uh, and we we know about the horrors of uh, of the Western Front. We've talked today about the the horrors of the Eastern Front in the Second War. Uh, how does a good Christian keep his faith, knowing what uh, man can do to man? And the striking thing is that many good Christians were involved in those wars and managed to survive. I'm sure that their faith was tested sorely, and some of them were shaken, but. Um, there were uh, believers on both sides in many cases who were caught up in those things. It occurs to me that when you are involved in, if you're fighting on the side of Nazi Germany, 
It doesn't mm. necessarily mean you're a Nazi. And if you're fighting on the side of the Soviet Union, it, exactly. you're not really a Soviet necessarily. Uh, those people were Russians and part of other cultural groups within the sphere of influence there. It's really two really bad leaders leading two really bad governments who had driven these people at each other's throats. Um, and I'm not absolving anybody of any responsibility for any uh, you know, atrocities that may have been committed by either side of it. But what does it take for you to continue a siege against a city like that where a million people are starving inside uh, the borders of that city? Uh, you must fear what's behind you more than you fear what's ahead of you. And these people, um, you know, it, these are political expressions, these, these wars that we've had as a, as a civilization over the years. Uh, most people in most countries have no desire to take up arms and to risk their lives and to lose their families and, um, you know, and to deal with everything that has to happen in war. But I think we do run a risk if we say that this is, we've never seen the like of it and we never will again. Well, we may not see that kind of mechanized warfare because wars are fought differently now than they were then. But I think we do need to hold on to the idea by doing what you guys have done, which is immerse yourself in the history of these times to realize that the humanity that engaged in that activity is the same humanity that lives in the breast of walking humans today, that we can engage in behavior like this, that there are evil leaders, that there are people who are, who are so hungry for power that they will do anything it takes and will subjugate entire nations under their will. And I, I don't think we ever wanna lose touch with the fact that that could happen again. I, I don't think we should have young people study this time in history and say, we just wanna show you this sort of historical anachronism to see how quaint things were back in the day when these, barbar these barbaric uh, primitives were at each other's throats because that same spirit dwells in each of us today and can be unleashed if we let it. And we should teach this history so that we never let it. Well said, thank you. Uh, Bill mentioned uh, that during the backstage, which is available to uh, our uh, members of BillWhittle.com, that I called Nazi Germany the worst regime in human history and the Soviet Union the second worst regime in human history. And let me explain that. We had, as Americans, had to pick a side in that war, and we chose correctly. We had to back the Soviet Union for, one, a very selfish reason that we knew about at the time, and two, for a reason we didn't find out about until after the war. The first is that it was inevitable that after World War II, we were going to end up in a Cold War with whoever won on the Eastern Front. And it was just better for us to face the less technologically advanced Soviets than it would have been the more technologically advanced Nazi Germans. Just Flat out, cold geopolitics, that's the fact. The other reason, though, we found out about after the war, as horrible as the Holocaust was, it was only a part of a German program, a Nazi German program called General Plan East, which is probably the most horrific thing anybody ever put to paper. And we had to rebuild it from agenda and other people's notes at the time because the original documents were destroyed. But General Plan East called for the murder, enslavement, or expulsion of basically all the Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Lithuanians from Eastern Europe, expelled to Siberia to starve to death because the infrastructure wasn't there to feed them, used to slave labor and work to death for, for German colonists who were supposed to repopulate European Russia, the European part of the Soviet Union. And it was absolute fantasy. 60 million Germans were never going to be able to colonize uh, the space that had been occupied by 120 million Slavs. Not, it's just not going to happen, not possible. It was absolute fantasy, but it was murderous fantasy. And if the Nazis won the war, they were going to kill tens of millions of people in pursuit of an utter bit of madness. So yeah, it wasn't, wasn't an easy, uh, or excuse me, it wasn't a difficult choice to make. We did right. And that's your right angle on that, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. Just a quick reminder, the content like this needs sponsors like you. So if you're not a member, we'd love to have you on board. Click over at BillWhittle.com, join today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.